There you go. Thank you. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
I think you'll enjoy his time. Uh, Kyle McReynolds, he's a bank manager at People's Bank in Newburgh. So if you want free money, he might have it. Well, thank you everybody for coming out today. I uh, appreciate uh, the cold weather. I know we have a cold snap going on right now. So again, my name is Kyle McReynolds. I've been involved with the museum for over eight years now. Uh, as Mark said, I help with collections. I also manage our social media. I'm born and raised in Evansville. I currently live in Newburgh, Indiana with my wife and my two kids. Uh, it's been a big history buff my entire life. Growing up, my grandparents um, on both sides of the family were big uh, history lovers as well as my parents. So we spent a, a lot of my youth visiting historical places and museums. So that's kind of where my love of history comes from. Uh, specifically, naval history was when I was a child, Bob Ballard uh, discovered the battleship, German battleship Bismarck. And uh, one of my classmates' father was a supporter of the Hall Institute and gave a, a wonderful presentation that basically inspired me for the rest of my life in, in this area of history. So um, today, I'm, uh, the last five or six years, I've been an avid collector of World War II naval photography. So a lot of the photos that you're going to see in this presentation today actually come from my private collection. Um, specifically, uh, Germany documented everything, personally and professionally. So they're one of the easier nations to actually show a lot of these photos from right there. So they took a lot of photos. So, uh, today we're going to talk about the heavy units of Germany's Kriegsmarine, or war Navy. So, uh, what constitutes a heavy unit? So, uh, for us Navy veterans, what that means is heavy cruisers, aircraft carriers, and battleships. Uh, there were a number of treaties between World War I and World War II that kind of loosely defined it. Uh, basically, for the Germans, any ship more than 6,000 tons is classified as a heavy cruiser. We call the battleship a heavy unit. And the carrier over uh, 23,000 tons is considered a large carrier instead of a light So, uh, the Washington Naval Treaty in 1922 was the world's first uh, basically military arms limitation agreement. There was after World War I, there was going to be a massive uh, naval race, again, which kind of led up to World War I, and the nation, the naval power of the world came in. Not to do that, they basically not build ships uh, for 10 years. Then they had the London Naval Agreement of 1932. Uh, at this point, Germans, Germans politics changed, and eventually Germany and Great Britain had their own separate agreement in 1935 that also set some of these guidelines. So, a brief history of Germany's Navy before World War II, and I'm going to let this this meme here, some of the, there, there's a lot to go over that we're not going to go into today. It kind of bases into starts. The Imperial German Navy, the Kaiser Marine, was founded in 1867 with the unification of Germany. Uh, the growing nation had a surprising foreign influence on its future growth. That lady. And, and if you don't know, that's Queen Victoria of England. She was rather proud of her. And she was rather proud of sharing that with her two grandsons, future uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II and his brother, Prince Henry of Prussia. Uh, that is Kaiser Wilhelm in a British Grand Admiral's Navy uniform. And he had that title ceremonially until the war began in 1914. His brother, Prince Henry, served his entire military career in the German Navy, and he even commanded the high seas fleet before the beginning of World War I. So her influence on her two grandsons led to the naval arms race between Germany and Great Britain that indirectly led to World War I. The Great War and the high seas fleet, I'm not gonna try to cover that whole thing and, and as part of this thing, because it's out of the scope of this, but these are photos of uh, Germany's high seas fleet uh, during their yearly summer exercises. Um, by the beginning of World War I, they had the second largest navy in the world, only uh, under Great Britain. Um, they did have notable engagements, the Battle of Helgoland and Blight, uh, most importantly, the inconclusive Battle of Jutland, uh, but eventually Germany lost the war. So the, 
the Treaty of Versailles and the Grace Stella. Um, this fellow here shows an event they call Der Tag uh, in the German. That is the official surrender of the German Navy. Eventually, most of the modern units of the Imperial German Navy ended up in Scapa Flow in Scotland, where they were entered. Um, on June 1st, 1919, uh, news had been passed to the German Admiralty at Scapa Flow that the fleet was going to be turned over to victorious allies and the ships would be dispersed between the different uh, Great Britain, the United States, France, etc. Instead of surrendering their ships, they scuttled them. Uh, all but one battleship was lost, uh, the SMS Bayern. So it's controversial at the time, but German, German crews and officers believed this would save their honor. So this left the German Navy in an even more precarious position because the ships that they lost at the answer had to be replaced by the ships that they already had back in Germany. So the German Navy shrunk even further after the Treaty of Versailles. So, the anti-war years, the Reichs Marine. So, with the signing of the Treaty of Versailles, German Navy now had the Reichs Marine, which was limited to six pre-dreadnought battleships, six light cruisers, 12 destroyers, 12 torpedo boats, and no submarines. With a total officer and sailor corps of 15,000 individuals. They couldn't replace any of their ships for 20 years at no greater than 10,000 tons. Now, that doesn't sound like 10,000 tons sounds like a lot, but most dreadnought class battleships by this time were well in excess of 20,000 tons. So, pretty, pretty limiting in their ability. So, we're going to talk about first the pre nap ships. Uh, Schleister, Holstein, and Schleister were the two active units that were still in use by the cruise marine at the beginning of World War I or World War II. So these ships predated World War I, um, armed with 11-inch guns, uh, about 14,000 tons, pretty limited. They were obsolete. Um, before World War I, these were referred to as two-minute ships because in battle, they were expected to last about two minutes in combat against more modern ships. Uh, during World War II, these ships saw mostly training purposes and escort duty, uh, and saw pretty limited exception, limited use with the exception of uh, one. Uh, Schleswig Holstein was the ship that started World War II. It was given orders um, to open fire on ammunition facilities in the fort in the Polish port of Danzig. And so it fired literally the open sh opening shots and then stayed in the port supporting uh, German army units who eventually captured the city uh, about a week later. And so these are, uh, this one, on, that's a personal photo of them cleaning an 11 inch gun. And then this is Schleswig, Holstein, and Schlesen as seen from the Hampshire uh, Admiral Schuh. So the Deutschland class Panzer ship, also known as pocket battleships by the British term, were the first German ships, heavy German ships that were produced for the Reichsmarine after World War I. Uh, they were a truly unique hybrid design, and they're worth their own presentation in their own right, uh, because they're truly, really unique ships. Um, Panzer ship literally means armored ship in German but their classification was changed to heavy cruisers when World War II started. Um, they were unique where basically it was a cruiser that had battleship guns on it. It had six 11-inch main guns, eight 15 centimeter uh, secondaries and torpedoes. Had a fairly good speed for a cruiser of its size and weight uh, between 27 and 28 knots. Now, these ships were supposed to be 10,000 tons, even before the world's most important corporal came to power in Germany in 1933, the Reichsmarine was already pushing the limit, past the limits of the Treaty of Versailles. So Deutschland, which is the first ship of the class right here, right after, and this photo is right after her completion, weighed slightly over 10,000 tons. Um, when she was, when her specifications um, were known to the other powers at the time, this ship set off a many arms race in Europe, mostly between France and Italy, who built, um, started with the Dunkirk class fast battleships, then it led to the modernization of Italy's battleship fleet, 
then they responded with building Rishalu class battleships. Italy responded building the Roma class battleships. Um, so it's, when I say they deserve their own presentation, there's a lot of politics that we go into uh, these ships alone. And there were three ships of the class Deutschland, Admiral Scheer, and Admiral Graf Spee. And then uh, this is. Uh, Spey returning to Germany with the Condor Legion in 1939. They were bringing home the Condor units from the Spanish Civil War. And then this is a dock in Hamburg uh, during the same time. So National Socialism comes to power, and the Reichsmarine was changed to the Kriegsmarine. Uh, with the rise of Hitler, he quickly ignored most of the limitations of the Treaty of Versailles, quickly rebuilt his military, the army, the Luftwaffe, and of course the Kriegsmarine. Hitler went about trying to make this official in a roundabout way. New France would never agree to made a separate agreement, the Anglo-German Naval Agreement, that began earnest efforts to rebuild their navy. Now, at the time, General uh, Grand Admiral Rader was in charge, and he was a surface combat commander from World War I. So, cruisers, battleships, destroyers, things like that. And that's what he wanted to build. So, in earnest, Hitler and Raider started trying to rebuild Germany's fleet. So these are four photos of the uh, Spanish War intervention. And so this is a quasi period of time where Germany was actually allied with Great Britain, France, Italy, and the United States in dealing with that situation. Um, this photo up here is two British battleships. Deutschland is all the way back in this corner. This is Malta. Uh, this is Admiral Scheer, um, believe in Malta, and that's actually the famous battleship, our battle cruiser HMS Hood, with Scheer. Actually, these two photos were taken together in the same location. Um, Germany did suffer losses during their patrols. Uh, the Deutschland was attacked, and over 100 of its crew were injured and killed uh, when communist Spanish forces attacked and bombed uh, the cruiser during uh, 1937. So the first standalone heavy unit uh, the cruise marine started building on their own were the Schwarzenegger class fast battleships. Um, at a ton, at a ton, tonnage of 36, 32,000 tons, these were pretty large modern battleships, but they had a lot of concessions, both mechanically, industry, and political. Um, these pictures of Schwarzenegger. This is Schwarzenegger as she was completed. Um, it was kind of a jury rig design. Germany was building and planning on larger uh, panzer ships that used steam propulsion instead of diesel power. And uh, when the Anglo-German the Ger the Anglo Naval Agreement was signed, they quickly modified the design with a lot of armor and an additional main battery turret. This made these ships um, very out of balance, and very prone and forward heavy. So when they were launched and they were sent into heavy seas, uh, their main battery, especially the first couple of years, was almost unusable. Um, water would break over the deck and flood down into the decks below, basically making this machinery and the crew uh, unable to work. Um, they did some modifications, and those ships were eventually changed when they were a little more combat. Uh, these are pictures of the battleship in Eisenhower, Charles twin sister. Um, they call them the beautiful twins because when they were completed, they were nearly identical in appearance, which is kind of rare for warships. But uh, eventually there were changes where you could easily tell them apart. So the next part of the Anglo German Naval Agreement was Germany was allowed to build five 10,000 ton heavy cruisers. And of course, they went way over that. Um, forgot to add the tonnage, but these ships ended up being about 16,000 tons each, um, well over the 10,000 ton limit. Um, they were the second largest heavy cruisers of the entire war, only behind the USS, USS Alaska class battle cruisers, which were technically classified as heavy cruisers themselves. Those were armed with 12 inch guns. The German ships were armed with eight inch guns. Um, they were big, they were heavy, they were lightly armed, lightly armored, and they had lots of mechanical problems. Um, these were not really a successful uh, ship besides their guns. 
for eight inch guns were considered some of, if not the most accurate uh, type during World War II when the Allies tested a variety of them after the war. You can see this is Admiral Hitler under construction and then this is one of their anti-aircraft guns. This is an example of, well, Germany's poor decision-making skills leading up to World War II and during World War II. Uh, on the left is uh, the cruiser Lutzow under construction. This ship would be about 80% complete when Germany sold her to the Soviet Union, where she was never completed and actually surprisingly survived World War II only to be sunk as a target by the uh, USSR afterwards. Traditionally, her sister ship on the right, Salitz, um, was 95% complete when it was decided to scrap her as a cruiser and rebuild her as a light aircraft carrier, which was never done nor completed. So you have 40, roughly 40,000 tons of shipping and, and time and material that was never used in combat. So we run next to the Bismarck class class <laughs> battleships. Arguably, probably the most famous battleships in World War II. Um, obviously, Bismarck is up top. This is shortly after she was delivered, uh, where she's actually sailing down to have her radar and top mass instruments installed. They're not quite up there like you can see in the bottom here, turpits. Um, these were both until very recently when the Queen Elizabeth um, Carriers were completed by the UK. These were the largest warships ever built in Europe. Um, at its bare bones, 41,000 tons, up to 53,000 tons. Probably turbids by the end of the war with all of her additional anti-aircraft guns, probably pushing 57,000. <laughs> they were armed with eight 15-inch or 38-centimeter main guns, 12 15-centimeter secondary guns, and 42 anti-aircraft guns, with a respective speed of 30 knots. Um, they were also incredibly heavily armored, which deviated mostly from most of their naval designs, except maybe the Japanese model class. And this was most primarily because um, Germany had so few capital ships, they had to make them as armored as possible, trying to make them as survivable as possible for what combat they would have against primarily uh, the Royal Navy of the UK. Then we have the Graf Zeppelin, the only completed carrier by the Kriegs Marine World War II. Was never officially completed, never even had an air wing, because the Kriegs Marine and Hermann Goring Wolfhaba could never come to agreement on who was going to control the planes and the pilots that would serve on the ship. Goring absolutely refused to give control of, of his aircraft and pilots to the German Navy. And Basically, they wasted a lot of time, money, and material on a ship that was never used. <coughs> so now we enter the combat. Now, uh, I have the original photograph over here at the table. This is a personal photograph from a crew member of the SS City of Flint. It was the first American ship that was um, attacked and then it was actually taken over by a prize crew of the German surface raider during World War II. Uh, prior to the start of the conflict, Hitler knew that the war was going to start on a particular date. So he sent Deutschland and Graf Spee into the Atlantic uh, to be ready to enter combat situations. Deutschland had the North Atlantic and Graf Spee had the South Atlantic. So on October the 9th, 1939, the city of Flint was taken over by a prize crew. It has its own pretty interesting history. The ship was then sailed to Norway. And at the time, the USSR was an ally, so then they tried to send the ship to the Soviet Union to enter in the crew. The Soviet Union refused, went back to Norway, where Norway was like, why is the ship back? And why do you have people here? You can't do this. And so then they interned the cargo ship, sent, and gave, took the Germans off, and gave the ship back to the American crew. Ship went back to the United States, sadly, only to be sunk two years later by German submarine. Yeah. Germany's first loss of the heavy unit was the Admiral Grash Bay, 
Uh, like I said, at the very beginning of the war, she was sent on uh, a merchant raid mission where she dived into the South Atlantic as far as Madagascar. Um, <coughs> She, the importance that Great Britain and France thought about these vessels, and Germany had a very small service fleet, but they had eight battle groups searching for this ship in the South Atlantic when she was there, accompanying about 29 warships <coughs> altogether. So um, eventually she um, sailed to the Uruguay Port Monte de Madeo, where the Battle of River Plate took place. She was attacked by uh, two British light cruisers and one heavy cruiser. Um, unfortunately, in your sense on the German side of things, her commander, while highly respected, uh, Captain Langsdorff, he was a submarine commander for most of his career, so he wasn't the most experienced surface ship commander, and he made some poor decisions. And the, the ship was damaged, so he took into port. And this is kind of one of those examples where Great Britain's signals intelligence shines they quickly flooded the news in and around the area that the, there was a much larger British fleet coming to relieve the light cruisers. Langsdorff now thinks he's bottled in and he has nowhere to go. And he decides to scuttle the ship. So this photo is actually of a, a Grash Bay sailing outside the port of Matavideo and local civilians are waving goodbye. Uh, within about 30 minutes, the ship would be blown up. Fortunately for the Germans, they did such a poor job of blowing it up um, that they left a lot of really sensitive and important equipment, like the radar and the sonar equipment, intact. Um, and so after the German crew was entered, the British were able actually to show up and take apart some of this equipment and provided a lot of intelligence on the, the capabilities of the German Navy. Langsdorff uh, ended up committing suicide when he returned to the port, and his body was eventually returned to Germany. Operation Visegrad, or the invasion of Norway. Um, probably the most important event for the Kriegsmarine during World War II. Um, it completed its invasion of Norway, it was successful, but uh, a lot of material was. Now, for the heavy units, it wasn't so bad. Um, the destroyer fleet and light cruisers took the brunt of it, but uh, these were losses the Kriegsmarine could ill afford early on in the war. Um, this photo down here is actually Scharnhorst and Gneisenau and Admiral Hitler in Trondheim. And this is the panzer ship Lutzow entering a Norwegian fjord um, sometime in like 1942. <coughs> the loss of Blucher. Blucher was literally a brand new Admiral Hitler class heavy cruiser. She had barely completed her workup. Her crew was not adequately trained and during the invasion of Norway, they sailed her into also um, a harbor where she steamed past a rather an antiquated coastal defense fort armed with two 11-inch guns and torpedoes from 1899, if I remember. The commander who was due to retire within the next few days was commanding a group of recruits who really didn't know what they were doing. Um, but they were able to fire multiple rounds into the blooper and hit it with torpedoes that led to it sinking. Um, I mean, the, there were army units above or on the ship that successfully made it to shore, so in the grand scheme it didn't impact, but for the cruise marine to lose a brand new ship um, it, it, the, the, is immeasurably lost for, for them in the sense of combat purposes. So, um, Admiral Hitler and HMS Blower. So during the invasion of Norway, while Blucher is being sunk, and also uh, Admiral Hipper is sailing north to bring uh, army units to Trondheim in northern Norway, which is an important harbor for steel. Um, Sweden had steel mines, but they couldn't actually get the steel out of Sweden, so they sent it through Norway to the port of Trondheim in Norway. So, um, this is the globe where I'm attacking Admiral Hitler, and why this is kind of an important naval moment is um, Lower Worm would be lost uh, attacking the heavy cruiser, but her gallantry and 
was so admired by the German crew, and especially uh, Captain Haig of the Admiral Hipper, when they returned to Germany, Haig made a very direct effort through the Red Cross, Red Cross to contact the Royal Navy to write a letter um, talking about the bravery and gallantry of the crew and its commander. And um, by that decision, of course, with the survivors um, that were also picked up by other Royal Navy ships, its commander was awarded the Victoria Cross, the first such example during World War II for a British national. <laughs> Operation Juno, the sinking of HMS Glorious. Um, this attack by the battleships uh, Scharnhorst and Gen Eisenau was against uh, the aircraft carrier HMS Glorious and its two escorting destroyers, Arden and Acosta. This situation is one of those examples where Germany definitely seized on surprise, but it showed the Royal Navy's ineptness at times during the war. Not that Germany had plenty of its own examples. At the time, Glorious was being commander, commanded by a captain whose only experience in commanding ships was in submarines. And as they were bringing uh, fighter aircraft home from Norway, uh, because at this point, Great Britain knew that the invasion of Norway was going to be successful for Germany. They were trying to pull their material out. Uh, the captain of the air wing and the captain of the Agent Glorious got into an argument, and he put the captain of the air wing under arrest and was planning on court martialing him when they got back to Scapa Flow. So when the carrier was sailing out in a combat zone, they had no airplanes flying cover or reconnaissance. So this is how Eisenhower and Charles were able to surprise the three ships. Um, showing the capability of Scharnhorst and Eisenhower and their 11-inch guns, Scharnhorst quickly scored a hit at 26,300 yards, arguably the longest hit in naval warfare on a moving combat vessel. Now, to give you an example of how far that is, if Scharnhorst was at USI, it would hit the Walmart in Newburgh, Indiana. That's about <laughs> roughly 15 miles. That's what 26,300 yards is. So that's a pretty amazing hit on a moving ship that's firing on other ships under a smoke screen. <laughs> so these are actual combat photos of uh, Ben Eisenhower, from Ben Eisenhower. This is her 11-inch battery firing. This is Scharnhorst leading, firing at Glorious. And then this photo up here is her secondary battery fighting, uh, firing and eventually sinking the two escorting uh, British destroyers. Commerce raids. Um, eventually, they sent out uh, Admiral Scheer and Deutschland out for other attempted uh, commerce raids who were basically hunting down merchantmen. Now, Scheer's, Scheer had a very successful commerce raid where she sailed, she steamed 46,000 miles um, and sank 17 merchantmen over 113,000 pounds. Um, but subsequent naval actions, basically, this was the last really truly successful commerce raid that. Germany would have for the rest of the war. Um, then you have uh, Operation, Operation Berlin. Now, the Eisenhower and Charles were sent into the North Atlantic for three months, um, attacking convoys. Um, they sank 22 merchant ships over the course of time, about 100,000 tons. Um, <coughs> They suffered no combat losses. They did it. They did encounter uh, resistance and British naval units, um, but they were under extremely strict orders not to engage British capital ships. So every time that occurred, the Eisenhower and Scharnhorst fled, and that that was the rules of engagement they had to follow. Um, one of the more interesting examples, this photo up here, is the Eisenhower attacking. Uh, the Chilean Reaper, it's a, just a 1,800-ton cargo ship. Um, it was full of bacon, <laughs> and its captain decided uh, that she was going to attack the Gnaizen now with her one three-inch gun. <laughs> she held on for over an hour. The Gnaizen now had to expend 71 of her 11-inch <laughs> cannon shells and over 100 of her 15-centimeter secondary guns to sink that. So. Uh, again, another example where the German captains uh, praised the British sailors, whether on merchantmen or on combat ships. So eventually, they uh, ended up back in France to end that operation. 
And then the main voyage of Battleship Bismarck. Um, again, that, that episode in history is our, requires its own presentation. Um, this is Bismarck shortly before she sailed to Norway. She still is actually sporting some of the camouflage that she wore during uh, combat. This little wave break right up here would eventually be sailed over. This is Bismarck firing on uh, Prince of Wales uh, after the hood is sunk. And then this is um, Prince Eugen, the escorting heavy cruiser, um, who, following Bismarck after the Battle of Denmark Strait. Um, when the battle began, Prince Eugen was actually leading uh, Bismarck, and the two actually at a distance have a very similar appearance. So Hood and Prince of Wales initially thought Bismarck would be the leading ship, so they're firing and focusing on Prince Eugen and allows Bismarck to fire pretty much unattested. Eventually, um, Hood, who people don't realize if you follow neighbor, was probably at the time the world's most famous warship. And she was considered uh, the queen or king of the, the Royal Navy. When Bismarck's crew, when they were training, were talking about taking on and sinking a ship, it was always the Hood. And so it kind of <coughs> so dread initially when the ships were spotted and it was Hood. But, uh, luckily for the Germans and horrible for the British, um, uh, Bismarck scored uh, an early hit that blew up um, her magazines with Hood sinking rapidly with only three of her crew surviving. Um, the Prince of Wales was the following battleship. She was a new King George of the fifth class. She was so new, she still had machinist and um, crew or people aboard from uh, the Navy Guard. She didn't even have a full complement. Um, she had a lot of issues with her main battery, and she was quickly damaged by Bismarck and Prince Eugen, and she had to retreat. Um, subsequently, uh, Bismarck, as she fled into the North Atlantic, was attacked by the HMS Ark Royal, which damaged her rudder, which essentially sealed her fate. Um, her rudder was jammed. Um, she was low on fuel. The Royal Navy sent about 33% of its surface fleet to hunt down Bismarck, and she had a final engagement um, with uh, the King George V and the HMS uh, Nelson, and subsequently sank with significant losses. Prince Eugen went on uh, to try to break out to the Atlantic to attack merchant ships, but uh, her unreliable engines quickly caused her to end up back in France. Bobbled up in France. So uh, these are photos of Gneisenau, Schoenhunters, and this is Gneisenau right after she entered Brest. Um, basically for a period of time, these three ships were there um, hiding out. Uh, there was hope for Gneisenau and Schoenhurst to break out originally um, with Bismarck and Prince Eugen, but they were taken out of their dry docks and put um, dockside. You really can't see it, but there would have been a big dock here and they were both over there. They were quickly attacked by the Royal Navy and subsequently damaged again and had to be put back in the dry dock, dry dock to go under go more repairs. So eventually, um, too much of the cruise marine was sitting in France, and at that time, German strategic thinking was Norway was a much more important place. So they had to get their ships out of France and back to Germany so they could get them to Norway to attack convoys. So the breakout, Operation Service. So, Arguably, this is probably the Kriegsmarine's finest hour during World War II in the sense of they didn't sink any ships. Actually, the guys in our charge were both damaged. But they steamed up the Straits of Dover, right past the home fleet of the British Navy and the Royal Air Force, and they got home with just two mine hits, which sadly were actually German mines, not British mines. The British were so ill-prepared to handle the situation that Germany did and there were so many confluence of errors, um, people not communicating over radio, they had sighted the German ships. Um, it's also an example, a very rare example, of the Kriegsmarine and the German Air Force working together. The German Air Force provided um, constant air cover for three ships during the battle, um, including the person that was in charge of that is uh, the famous uh, German Air Force General, Otto Galland. He was the one that was directly in charge of that, so it's kind of not surprising they were successful in that aspect. 
because they have the best commander on it. So in this photo, you can see Prince Eugen, and then following uh, Schoenhorst and Eisenhower in the front, this is Prince Eugen, and this photo is during Operation Cerberus. She's painted really in a dark kind of bluish gray, lots of anti-aircraft guns added, including this quadruple 20 millimeter set here. And then these, this photo up here, um, this gentleman right here is actually filming the battle as they're attacking uh, combat ships from the Royal Navy. They're coming out to try to sink the battleships. And then of course the fog. So, So, by sheer coincidence, the same day that Gnaiz and I was repaired from her mine strike from Operation Cerberus, she was in a dry dock like this one here in the photo. She was attacked by the Royal Air Force um, and subsequently hit um, by a bomb, an armor piercing bomb by that first turret forward. The bomb entered uh, one of her magazines and exploded. What the British didn't know, and what the Germans shouldn't have done, because it it was against their own operating and safety procedures. The ship was still armed while undergoing repairs. The cordite in that magazine exploded, and the forward section of the bow basically was destroyed. Um, the ship was disabled and unusable. At that point, they weren't sure what she was going to do. There was an attempt to reconstruct her with new armament, but uh, eventually that work was stopped as the war turned against Germany. So anti-convoy duty, uh, at this point, what remained of the heavy units of the German Kriegsmarine were sent to Norway to attack uh, the convoys that were coming to Murmansk and Russia to supply the Soviet forces. Um, the picture on the left is uh, Admiral Tipper and Admiral Scheer, and actually their unsuccessful um, breakout to attack the convoy during the Battle of the Barents Sea. And then the picture on the right is um, the battleship Turbids, uh, Admiral Hipper, I believe Prince Eugen, during uh, the attack on PQ-17. Uh, these two moments are important because the breakout of uh, Turbids for PQ-17, surface units actually never met any of the uh, convoy or British escorting forces. But the fact that they were there scared the British so much they scattered the convoy. And subsequently, in the following days, nearly the entire convoy was destroyed by submarines and aircraft. It was such a bad loss that Churchill personally decided that they would not send any more convoys to Russia for six months. Subsequently, six months later, uh, Hipper and Scheer were sent out and the Battle of Barents Sea took place. Um, it was so unsuccessful for the Kriegsmarine, Hitler was furious and ordered the entire surface fleet of the German Navy to be scrapped. Admiral Rader resigned in protest. Uh, Carl Donitz was promoted to Grand Admiral of the Kriegsmarine. He was able to convince Hitler to change his mind, uh, but basically the force took a, a completely different direction after that. So the sinking of Scharnhorst. Um, December uh, 26, 1943, Scharnhorst was sent alone, un unescorted with no aerial recon to attack it. British convoy heading to Mormansk. Um, she quickly was found uh, by a group of British light cruisers. Unknown to her, to Scharnhorst, uh, because in that initial attack, her radar was damaged, the 
British battleship HMS Duke of York and its escorting light cruisers and destroyers were close by, and the British light cruisers were pushing Charles <coughs> into the direction of this other force. She was quickly attacked and overwhelmed um, and finished off with five torpedoes, which caused a magazine explosion. Only 36 of the crew survived. Um, it was such a harrowing battle on the British end because the Charnors kept fighting the entire time. Guns were still going off as the ship was sinking. That uh, the, uh, the British Admiral in charge of Duke of York. strategically looking at World War II, the construction of these ships was actually a benefit for the Allies. Um, during their combat, um, they sunk one battle cruiser, one aircraft carrier, four destroyers, two auxiliary cruisers, and 65 merchant. Now, these ships did require the Royal Navy, America, and Russia to put a lot of resources into containing and protecting them, but when Germany started World War II, they had 57 U-boats. And then given time, at that, at that time, a third of those units would be under repair, a third would be in training. It's roughly about 18 combat U-boats. Most of these were short-range U-boats. One Admiral Hitler class heavy cruiser could have built 25 U-boats. They built two, they never finished. One aircraft carrier could have built roughly 35 U-boats. They built an aircraft carrier they never used and were never finished. During the Anglo-German naval agreement, Ger Great Britain gave away the ability for uh, Germany to build up to 70% of the Royal Navy's submarine force. But you had people like Admiral Radar, Radar, who was in charge of the Kriegsmarine, who was a surface guy, who was a battleship guy. He wanted to build these big, huge, heavy battleships. And then you had people like Carl Donuts who replaced him, who was a submarine guy, begging for submarines. Hitler liked big, expensive warships. Battleships were a sign of prestige at that time for every nation that could afford to build them. They were a propaganda piece. They were expensive to build, they, they provided a lot of jobs. So on a propaganda and uh, economical standpoint, Building battleships was kind of important if you could afford to do it. But strategically, Germany didn't need a lot of battleships. Didn't need a lot of heavy cruisers. It needed panzer ships, because panzer ships were diesel powered and could sail or steam twice as far as a battleship. It needed submarines. So had Germany, at the outset of the war, used the tonnage that it was allowed by Great Britain to build a much larger submarine force, those early years where the U-boat force was highly successful would have been significantly worse for Great Britain, France, and eventually America because that small part, paltry force of, say, 18 combat U-boats for those first maybe 12 months would have been significantly larger and deadlier. So, as you know, in the sense of armchair admirals, when we can look back at history in hindsight 2020, the heavy units of the Kriegsmarine, the, the men, who served on these ships fought gallantly, but strategically their construction was a benefit for the Allies because those materials, men, and time spent on them instead of building submarines or other surface units that could have been more useful for Germany. Now, doesn't mean Germany could, shouldn't have had a surface fleet. You had to have surface ships to protect ports and other avenues of attack uh, the same thing when World War I happened, people said, you know, they should have scrapped the high seas fleet and built only submarines. If you don't have a sur any surface fleet, somebody can attack you in impunity above water, and then what's the point of having submarines? So, can't could, could do away with it, but um, all said and done for the, the four battleships, and five heavy cruisers, 
an aircraft carrier they built, they could have built over 375 brand new submarines um, during the war. And a lot of those would have been in the Kriegsmarine early in the war that when it was much more important. Um, Prince Eugen was the only heavy unit that survived World War II from the German Kriegsmarine. It was eventually expended as a target during the nuclear tests of Abel and Baker uh, in 1946. It survived both nuclear blasts, but was heavily radioactive and it sank. Um, you can dive on that wreck today. Um, it was recently worked on by the United States Navy because it actually had a lot of oil aboard. It's going to cause an ecological disaster. Um, so the Navy actually drilled into the ship and pumped out nearly all of its oil. Um, parts of the battleship that I now you can actually visit after it was damaged beyond repair. Parts of the ship including its rear turret, were shipped to Norway, where they built a coastal defense battery. And that turret still exists as a park and tourist destination it's in Norway today. Uh, parts of the Grash Bay are in Montevideo, Uruguay, that you can see. Um, and then, of course, um, Bob Ballard finding the Bismarck. That site has been um, it's extensively studied, not quite as much as the Titanic, but um, it's been diving on most of the time. So, sorry, I couldn't finish up with the pictures, but um, if you have any questions, feel free to come up uh, after we're done eating and done and, and see the collection up here. And, and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you.